Hello everyone, welcome to the DH Education Podcast, your program to be updated on the digital heritage education domain. I'm your host, Raul Gomez Hernández, and I'm glad to be here with you. In this fifth episode of the podcast, we will talk with Aaron Peterer about the relevance of the digital heritage educational resources produced by museums, the connection between methodology and social values, how digital education materials have been developing in the own front house, and how important it is to imply young audiences on the developing process. Stay to the end and discover some innovative projects and book recommendations to explore more around this topic. Today, the technological advances together with the living in a COVID-19 pandemic have promoted the widespread application of blended learning, distant learning or flipped classroom pedagogies, opening the ways of teaching and learning. At the same time, cultural heritage spaces, like museums where education plays an important role, have turned into digital, adapting educational trends and new perspectives in education to their educational activities for schools and young people. Some of these trends and movement in education are active learning and participation in education for democratizing the classroom, moving the classroom outdoors in place-based learning pedagogies, studying the content at home and putting them into practice in the classroom using a flipped classroom pedagogy, working on projects developing competencies in a project-based education pedagogy. The application of these trends has a very positive impact in museum education, but they are not the only ones. For example, some museums have shared digital resources with the schools, others create their own projects where the students can be involved in the development of resources for the dissemination of cultural heritage. What is the most effective way to engage with cultural heritage through digital? From this overview, let me propose two more questions. How new trends in education have impacted the way of working in museums? Is there a correct way for engaging students? This week, I would like to talk with Aaron Peter about it. Hello, Aaron. Thank you very much for being here in this fifth episode. Hello, Raul. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let me introduce yourself a bit to the audience. Aaron Peter is a project manager based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. He studied a PA in Comparative Arts and Media Studies at Bright University, Amsterdam. Since 2002, he has been working for the Amfront House as an international project manager, producing and directing international educational projects about traces of discrimination. Among his projects is Memory Walk, where students produce film clips discussing monuments. Most of the institutions have been closed due to COVID-19, and the schools have become more digital, taking e-learning, distant learning, and blended learning as the most common methods of education. In this context, how important is for you to have memorial places or museums like Amfran House producing digital educational resources for young people to help them to explore the values of cultural heritage in this time? Well, thank you for your question, Raoul. Obviously, not only the Anne Frank House, but many other museums in the Netherlands face the same challenges. They cannot welcome visitors. And lots of our visitors always have been young people. And as much as it is our mission to preserve the hiding place where Anne Frank and the other seven people were in hiding, uh, the diary and the values of the diary, um, it is also in our mission to do education education, to educate young people all over the world about anti-Semitism, about discrimination, about racism, about these ills in society. And therefore, there is no reason for us not to stay active in the corona pandemic. So we still need to stay active, which means that we still need to be doing our educational work all over the world. Now, these times obviously have been very challenging for us as in my work I mainly work with traveling exhibitions one of them is called Anne Frank a history for today the other one is called let me be myself so usually what I would be doing is I would train young people to become peer guides for the Anne Frank exhibition and then those young peer guides guide 
their fellow classmates and community through the Anne Frank exhibition and talk about the topics, discuss their relevance for today. And this is really where all my passion is, but this is also what we um, in the educational department do all over the world. And now we had to find ways of still doing this education without being in the physical classroom. Um, we have already developed um, digital learning materials uh, prior the corona pandemic, so before the corona pandemic, but of course we've also had to be inventive in finding new projects, in creating new tools, how to reach our uh, audience, how to reach our students. Um, one of the challenges is that, especially in Holocaust education, you always have to create a safe space, a safe classroom for your long, young learners when they participate in your programs. And it is a very big challenge to do that if you're not with them in the classroom. So how do you do this in the digital age when you're only connected remotely to them? And very often the students aren't even sitting in the classroom because they are doing homeschooling themselves. So that's one of the challenges um, that we had to consider. But still, you know, there are these tools that we've managed to develop to be used remotely and also to be used in a distinct learning environment. One of the tools that um, I utilized basically is the online 360 degrees version of the Secret Annex. And I actually guide young people, mainly students, but also lots of educators through the 360 degrees version of the Secret Annex. So I'm connected, let's say through Google Meet, through Zoom um, with my audience. Um, and we do educational activities as we go through the Secret Annex. That's a complete explanation, Aaron, about the place of the digital educational resources in museums today, in a moment where it's very difficult to connect physically with young people. As a project manager working in educational projects with cultural heritage, I would like to know about your way of working. Did your method change a lot from a project to another one? Are your strategies connected to your values directly underlying all your projects and shaping what you do? It doesn't matter if they are physically like memory walk or digitally with this 360 degree visit to the secret annex that you mentioned. Um, well, of course, you know, these online tools, you know, and gadgets that we use, for instance, Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams or uh, Google Meets, you know, allow us to connect to our students that are far away and cannot visit the Anne Frank house right now, but also cannot visit their own school right now. So it's a great way to be connected. At the same time, what we do does not replace an actual visit to the Anne Frank house. It does not replace an actual visit to a memorial site. So this is really important for me. Once we return to face-to-face -face education in the classroom, then actually we can have longer workshops. We can go into more details when we talk about very important topics, you know, to discuss the Holocaust with students in one hour and to accept, to expect the same outcome that we usually have when we do, let's say, two-day workshops with students, you know, that will be out of this world. So this is not what we actually expect. But um, in general, you know, the projects that I do, they are based on peer education, right? So young people learn from other people, students learn from other students, and we also try to incorporate them when we do our online projects. So this is for the, the, the online world, let's put it like that. But then again, um, you know, when we're talking about what we did before and what we will do again after the pandemic, there's this one project that is called Memory Walk, which is a film creation workshop where the participants create films on monuments and memorialization. So this is also a lot based on peer education. It's very much about multi-perspectivity, you know, about analyzing monuments, analyzing what they mean for young people, especially critically analyzing those monuments. Yeah, monuments that have to do with histories of persecution, of violence, of racism. And, and it is so good, you know, to have young people discuss these topics when they visit actual monuments. Um, and, and when we visit those monuments, you know, we do not only pick the monuments that are, let's say, very, very prominent and a tourist attraction in every city. We also go to monuments that, let's say, 
are in neighborhoods that you would usually not visit as a tourist. You know, monuments that, um, let's say, uh, present atrocities um, that um, happened to or were committed to marginalized groups, to minorities, right? So this is also very important, what we try to do in those workshops, just to give you an example. That's right. I think strategies like participatory processes, engagement plans with young people, and the represented community's involvement actions or the democratization process of the culture should be very closely related with the social values and belief of any institution. These museums should be a place for reflection, but also these institutions or these memorial places must have an active role in the transformation of the communities and the dissemination of democratic values. Yes, you're totally right, you know, and what is very important for me is, let's say I do a, a memory walk film workshop in a city, you know, that I have never visited before, in a country that I have not worked uh, in a lot before. Wherever we work, we work with local partner organizations um, that are, you know, uh, connected or even are themselves experts on the topics that we want to discuss with our videos. But also those local organizations know the dynamics in society um so so what topics are are very relevant right now you know to talk about what is very controversial right so we bring in our methodology but together with local organizations with local know-how um, we then build up those workshops together and that's really one key to our success i think well, we have talked about the relevance of producing digital educational resources and your values and strategies about starting a project. Now, it's time for the Unfront House, the institution where you work. Some of the most important digital education resources and projects of this institution are memory walk, stories that move, the digital lesson, the secret annex, or the game Fair Play. Now, taking your experience working at the Unfront House, could you explain more to the audience how digital educational materials have been developed there? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in general, I can say that including youngsters in the development of your uh, product, you know, is definitely a benefit. Um, let's say we go to a city and do a film workshop on monuments and memorization. Once the young people leave our workshop, they will never look at the monument again the same way they did when they came into the workshop, in a positive sense. So when they have actually went through that workshop, they will have discussed you know, monuments and memorization and the relevance of certain monuments for their community with other young people. But then they also leave with an educational tool, which is one video clip, a documentary that they created together with their peers. And that is very, very powerful. So they have created this educational tool that they can stand behind, that they can be proud of. And with this educational tool, they can actually start discussions in their community about monuments, about memorialization, about the relevance of those monuments for society today, and also reflect on, okay, so we put up monuments for um, to remember the things that we did, to remember the people that we hurt, but we still face discrimination and racism and persecution in societies today. So this is something that we made to contribute that this discussion, you know, continues and in some cases even starts. So why do we doing that today? So this really works well, you know, to, to give a voice to young people, to taking them serious, not only the process, but also the product to involve them in creating the actual product they can really uh, stand behind. Yeah, it's great to see how many methods can be applied in this project. And related to that, I have a question. In this project, how does Sound of Front House imply young audiences, teachers, external creatives, and other groups of people in the developing process of digital learning materials? Well, you know, as in as with many other projects, there's lots of research that goes into those um, digital educational tools. Well, if I take um, stories that move, for instance, or or fair play, you know, we're actually dealing with with real people. And, and we listen to those people, you know, they're real teachers, they're real young people. 
that um, describe challenges that they meet, challenges that they are confronted with, but they also tell us, you know, how they see the world. Um, meaning for us, you know, as, as grown-ups developing something that, of course, we also develop, you know, but we, we include their voices. It's, it's not this top-down approach. So this is really important, not only for the film workshops, but, you know, for fair play, but also for, for stories that move. So this is really something that um, we can also say that, that uh, we are very proud of. I think the participation of the audience is very important to connect with the real issues society is living. Museums can be static, and the content produced should be related to them, connecting with the audience. Museums must show how moments from the past are alive today and how they are important for learning and building a better future. You're totally right, you know, and I started working for the Anne Frank House in 2002. And um, back then, you know, there were still many Holocaust survivors that visited schools, you know, not only in Austria, where I, where I come from, you know, but also in Germany, in the United Kingdom, in the United States. And now, as a matter of fact, you know, there are less and less Holocaust survivors, um, which means that this very important and sometimes unique opportunity of meeting a Holocaust survivor is is you know becoming something extremely rare for for young people and and to many young people that i talk to you know when when i talk to them about a project an Anne frank exhibition project or a film project that they participated in the most moving part the most um, educational part as if you wish to say was for them to be able to meet a holocaust survivor and talk to him or her about the their experiences and now that we do not have this connection anymore, or at least that the chances are small and smaller to talk to a Holocaust survivor in an educational setting. We need to find other methods to make this history still relevant to young people. So why is this still relevant for me today when my great-great-grandmother lived in that time and I live now? So these lessons um, are, are still really important and um, including uh, you know, new ways of, of using monuments, yeah. new ways of, 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 of tools. Th this is really, really important. You know, why is it really relevant? Why should it be relevant for young people today? So this is more our task as, as educators. And then again, if you manage to you know, make it relevant in terms of let them be involved in the process of creating those tools that they can really stand behind them, I think we, we, we have achieved a lot. So this is just one way that I think that we can still make this history relevant to young people today, although it's getting more and more of a challenge. So for instance, the, the, the VR, the virtual reality tour of the secret annex, which also exists as an app, by the way, you know, you could put on your Oculus uh, VR glasses and you could walk through the house um, yourself. You know, you don't need me as a guide, but you could actually explore the, the house with your uh, VR goggles. But, you know, these are means by which we can make um, these topics very attractive, you know, for, for young people. So, you know, why not? Maybe their, their first impulse is, wow, you know, there's a, a VR, there are VR goggles, or I can look at this in, in 360. I don't want to have a look at a picture. I don't want to read a text, but I definitely want to, you know, uh, learn more about this topic by using glasses, by walking through this space online, you know, with my class. So definitely this is something that we need to do. To end this talk, could you give the audience a tip for creating digital educational resources involving young people? Well, there is one thing that I think is extremely helpful, you know, um, it is, well, listening to content related podcasts, but also to follow webinars and there to, to get ideas, right? So there's this one webinar series of echoes and reflections and everybody can look them up and they offer their webinars uh, free of charge and you can sign up and uh, on their websites and, and look for these webinars that you find you know interesting or appealing 
and it's a variety of of you know different organizations that present there you know so tomorrow there will be a presentation by the illinois holocaust center uh, we will also be doing a vr guided tour through the secret annex so i would definitely try to find ideas find sources of inspiration in those um, webinars you know that are very accessible nowadays it's also one year into the pandemic it has become very very how can i say yeah very straightforward to to join webinars um as we can't meet in person thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and know more about the perception from the educational department of an institution what's to create educational projects with young people very welcome uh, it was a pleasure talking to you and um, i'm looking forward to listening to your podcasts If you would like to learn more about Contested Cultural Heritage, I recommend you a book published by Springer titled Contested Cultural Heritage, Religion, Nationalism, Erasur and Exclusion in a Global World, edited by Alain Silverman in 2011. To take a deeper approach around how methodologies and strategies used in cultural heritage projects are connected to social values, I suggest you to read the book published by the Getty Conservation Institute titled Values in Heritage Management, Emerging Approaches and Research Directions, edited by Rika Brami, Susan McDonald, Randall Mason and David Myers in 2019. If you want to know European projects working on social innovation through cultural heritage, I recommend you visit the Heritage and Social Innovation Observatory website. It aims to evaluate the state of social innovation in cultural heritage through the organizations, institutions, and projects related to its management, conservation, and dissemination. Another powerful project is the Preso Rural Project. It aims to foster the promotion of social and civic competencies in educational centers in rural areas to encourage young people with entrepreneurial spirit focus on the generation of local development initiatives that cover the needs of the environment where they live, preserving and promoting cultural heritage and traditions. Thank you very much for being today with Aaron Peterer and me in this podcast. Next week, a new expert will come and a new topic will be. Find all the resources from the topic we talk about in this podcast on the resource section of the TH Education blog. If you like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iBox, or any platform you listen to, and follow the project on social media. See you next week.